we are in the seventh week of a series where we've been looking at different people in the Bible who had to deal with issues of faith. And last week we talked about Simeon's patient faithfulness as he waited for the opportunity to see the Messiah with his own eyes before he died. This morning we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, let me encourage you to go ahead and find that, Mark chapter 5. And while you're doing that, let me also encourage you to take out your message notes and use those to follow along with us. But as we go to Mark chapter 5, we're going to hear about a woman who was living in terrible, terrible darkness. Now, let me ask you a question. You've probably heard the phrase, so dark, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Right? Are you familiar with that phrase? But have you ever actually experienced that kind of darkness? And I don't mean, you know, in your bedroom in the middle of the night and it's pretty dark, but there's still some light from the street light outside and the fire alarm on the ceiling and your cell phone that's charging beside your bed and you're like, oh, it's dark in here. No, 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 I don't mean that. I mean real, real darkness. I'm talking about the kind of darkness where literally you cannot see your hand move in front of your face even though you know it's there and you know it's moving and you know you ought to be able to see it, but you cannot. Last time uh, about this, or last year rather, about this time, my family and I took a, a trip to San Antonio. We went to SeaWorld last year and had a great time. But while we were there, we took a tour of the Natural Bridge Caverns just outside of, of town. Now, Natural Bridge Caverns is this incredible cave system. It's one of the largest in the country that you tour by descending a half mile below ground level uh, into an enormous cavern called the Discovery Room. And there are electric lights all along the way because there's about a million steps and they're very dangerous and it's wet and if you've ever been in a cave, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But when you get to the deepest part of the cave, the tour guide has everyone kind of set themselves, all right, kind of get set and get prepared and then she turned out all of the lights, okay, half mile under the earth. Does this seem like a good idea to you? And let me tell you something, it was dark, all right? It was dark, and I don't mind telling you it was scary for a few seconds until she turned on a little, just tiny pen light. And, and I tell you, when she turned on that light, it was like the whole world came back into existence. I mean, one moment, you're wondering if we've died, and this is it. This is the end. There's nothing. And the next moment, we're like, oh yeah, we're in a cave in Texas, right? And you can see everything all over again. You can see everything. Now, you couldn't believe how much light that little pen light could produce. And immediately, my mind went to this. And I don't know if you think like this, but this is how I think. Immediately, I began to think, if that light went out, if, if her battery burned out, we would never, and I mean ever, find our way out of here. It is not going to happen. Well, luckily, a little light goes a long way, especially in the darkness. Now, here's why I mentioned that kind of terrifying grope in the dark darkness. Because that's the kind of darkness the woman that we're going to read about was living in right up until the day, the moment, that she met Jesus. This is Mark chapter 5. I'm going to begin with verses 24 through 34. It says this, A large crowd followed and pressed around him, Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, and yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this story or how familiar with it 
you might be. Many have probably never heard it. But I want to propose two different responses to it, okay? Sometimes when we read something, when we hear something, especially in church, we sort of assume that there's just one way, the church way, right, to respond to something. And we kind of assume that everybody probably feels exactly the same way as we do. And that's not always the case. And so let me, let me propose a couple of different ways that, that people might read that story and think about it and respond to it. The first is two words, all right, and it's this, how nice, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the church response. How nice, how nice. That, that, that's the church program response. Almost the, you guys know what a golf clap is? Right, everybody golf clap with me. Exactly, that's, that, you got it. That's exactly right, okay? It, it's a nice story we just read. It's a sick woman, an available savior, savior, a pleasant healing. Next story, please, right? I mean, that's great. Let's move on. But you know what? Over the years, I've learned that the church program response that you often sort of hear on the outside is not always the same as what people are actually thinking and feeling on the inside. A different response to this story, maybe a more honest, authentic, transparent response if we take off our church colored glasses is this, just one word, unfair. Can you see it? Can you kind of understand what I might mean by that? Can you kind of understand why somebody might look at it and see it and feel that way? And again, I know it's hard because we've been conditioned for the first response, how nice, but I want you to think about this from the perspective of anybody who has ever prayed a prayer and felt like God didn't answer it. Or didn't answer it the way that we wanted Him to. Now surely I'm not the only one who's ever done that. Because the reality is, what we really have here, if we're being honest, is a woman who didn't even know Jesus. Do we all agree on that? She did not know Jesus. She only heard about who He was. She does not even ask Him for help. Did you notice that? She didn't go to Him and say, Jesus, Lord, Savior, help me, I need... She didn't do any of that. What she did do was she sneaks up behind Him. Somebody might argue like a coward. And think about it, basically steals a healing from Him. Tell me I'm wrong. And then we get confused because Jesus apparently didn't even know that He had healed somebody until it was too late. And if you were someone who's ever had a hurt or a disappointment or a difficulty, it would be so easy to read that story and to begin to think to yourself, you know, it's really not fair that she got a healing in the first place. I mean, hey, it's not like she even did anything to deserve it, did she? I never saw her in a community group, right? She never cooked a funeral dinner. Don't believe she ever made it to a, an outreach event. Sign-ups for a Fall Festival will be online this evening, right? We, we look at this story, and, and what we see here is a poor, pitiful woman who got a healing she really did not deserve. And you know what? If you feel that way, or if you felt that way after reading this story, I wouldn't blame you. I think it's understandable. The good news is... There is so much more to this story than maybe first meets the eye. In fact, to be honest with you, there's something kind of incredible here. We just have to look a little bit deeper to find it. Will you, will you go deeper with me? Will you look and see what God has for us? I'm going to use a, a little sermon tool this morning to break this story down. It's a, it's a sermon formula. It's called Facts, Faith, and Fruit. And you can use it in a lot of different places, but it's really good with, with miracles. Okay, Facts, Faith, and Fruit. The facts of the story, the faith that was displayed, and the fruit that resulted. You'll, you'll see that same pattern over and over and over again throughout the New Testament. So let's take a look at the story, and let's see what we can find. We're going to begin with, obviously, the facts. Okay, So the facts of this story. And, and if we're just being completely honest with one another, the facts of this story are a little discomforting. And pretty straightforward, and I think maybe the gospel writer Mark intended it this way because it helps us get a feel for the hopelessness of this woman, a feel for the suffering that she was going through in her life. The first fact of the story is found in verse 24. A woman was subject to bleeding for 12 years. A woman was subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, if you've ever heard this story and someone told you that the woman simply had uh, hemophilia, where a person's blood doesn't clot correctly and therefore they can just bleed constantly. That's understandable 
That's not quite the whole story here, okay? You see, the Greek makes it clear that this woman, what the woman suffered from, was continual, abnormal, menstrual bleeding. Now, we don't know the exact cause. The list of possibilities is enormous. Everything from kidney disease to ovarian cancer, and of course they wouldn't have necessarily known about those things at the time this was written. But whatever the cause, bleeding like this would have meant weakness, it would have meant pain, it would have meant severe discomfort. And even more significantly, whatever the illness, it caused her to be considered ceremonially unclean. That is, it, it, I can't express to you how important that is. Leviticus 15.25 says this. This is the law. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, listen, all of the days of the discharge, in the Bible, what does all mean? Go ahead. It means all. All of the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. Now, I know this may be an uncomfortable subject, uh, and I can hardly wait to hear how our children's pastor, Jessica Verdeen, explains this to the kids in live worship this morning. So be sure to ask questions over lunch, okay? I get it. I do. But, but, I want you to understand the seriousness and the severity of her situation. See, the idea of her remaining unclean was not a suggestion. All right? It's not like, hey, you know, if you don't feel good, if it doesn't work out the way you want it to, maybe you should do this. It's not like that. This is the law. This is the same kind of law that says thieves go to jail, murderers go to the electric chair, non-negotiable. And what that meant that was that no part of her life was left unaffected. As a wife, she literally, physically could not in any circumstance touch her husband. Maternally, she couldn't bear children. She couldn't touch any children that she had. Domestically, anything in her home that she touched would be considered unclean. And probably worst of all, spiritually. Because, you see, she was unclean because, and because of that, she couldn't enter the temple. And I, and I know that not being able to enter the temple may not seem like a big deal to us, right? Uh, but remember that the temple in Bible times was the center of your relationship with God. I need you to get this, okay? It, there, this is how you related to God was you go to the temple. You didn't pray on your own. You didn't worship on your own. You didn't relate to God on your own. You only did these things in the temple. But this woman couldn't go into the temple. And that means that she couldn't worship God. She couldn't relate to God. She couldn't even ask that her sins be forgiven. Now again, I know churches sort of get a, a, you know, a bad rap these days. And surely there have been times in your life where you thought, you know, how simple would my life be if I didn't have to think about God or church, right? Just, I mean, just go ahead and raise your hand up. Just go ahead and, and, and let me know, okay? <laughs> I think it every Monday morning, to be honest with you, all right? <laughs> You know what, I mean really, if, if I could just take God and church out of the equation of my life, think about all of the time that is wasted. Think about the energy used. Think about the money spent, right? But now before you decide that life would be so much better without church, you, you better think back to a time when a need was met in your life. A meal was cooked. A special relationship was made. A worship experience. A smile, a hug, a prayer. Come on, over the years, you've had a lot of needs met, haven't you? But not this woman. Spiritually, she was unclean. And she never experienced those things that we so easily take for granted. Not only was she physically exhausted and socially ostracized, but verse 26 tells us that she suffered a great deal under many doctors. She suffered a great deal. You know, we expect doctors to make us better, not worse. Correct? And I can tell you from personal experience that there is nothing worse than feeling as though you're at the mercy of a doctor who doesn't really care if you get better or not. And on the flip side, there's hardly anything better than feeling that your doctor genuinely cares about making you well. Are, are you with me on this? It matters. Well, this woman didn't have that. The Jewish Talmud gives no less than 11 cures for her condition. 
what do you want to bet she'd tried every single one of them? I would have, and so would you. Some were probably legitimate. Some were obviously nothing more than hollow superstition. One, one suggestion from the Talmud said that you need to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg around in a linen cloth for a certain number of days. And if you did that, then you would be healed. Okay? Another one was even better. It suggested carrying uh, that you find a barley corn kernel in the dung of a white she-donkey. Good luck on that, all right? And I'm not making it up either. I mean, that, that literally is what it said. Again, some of these treatments that, that probably were legitimate, but the bottom line is none of them worked. And I'm telling you that sometimes failed attempts at treatment are just as devastating as the pain of the illness that you're going through. Verse 26 goes on to say that instead of getting better, she was getting worse. Instead of getting better, she was worse. She woke up every day in a body that nobody wanted with an illness that nobody could figure out how to cure. In fact, I believe that she's down to her very last hope. And on the day that we encounter her here in Mark chapter 5, she's just about to pray out that last hope. Verse 27 says that she found him in the midst of an enormous crowd and that she touched his cloak. Now, depending on your translation, it may say she touched his cloak, may say she touched his robe, may say she touched the, the uh, fringe on his robe, but she touched him. Verse 29 says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Now, think about that for just a second. After all these years, after all these struggles, Immediately, it stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Now, I believe that the Bible is, is literally true. That the Bible is God's Word and that Jesus is God's living Word. And so when the Bible says immediately she felt healing in her body, I don't mean she just felt better. I mean she felt healing. The kind of healing that mends broken bones. The, the kind of healing that repairs the damage of a stroke and erases cancer. This woman who for so long had been living in darkness was healed when she touched the light of the world. So, there are the facts of the story. All right, She was sick. She was suffering. She was getting worse. She touched Jesus' cloak. She was healed. Praise God, right? I mean, it's, a great, it's a great story, but trust me, there's more to the story than just the facts. There is also the faith. Let's talk about the faith and two specific kinds of faith that are described in this story. First of all, there was belief displayed by the woman. Verse 28, she says, If I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And in the Greek, she was saying it over and over and over and over again. She was going through that crowd. She was set on him. She was making her way to him. And she was saying, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And I want you to understand that what she was making was a risky decision. Okay? See, she wasn't allowed, work with me here, to touch anybody. Okay? Okay? She's not allowed to touch anybody. In fact, at the moment, she is breaking the law because she's not allowed to be in that crowd at all. But you know, what choice does she have? I mean, honestly, what does she have to lose? All she had was a crazy hunch and a high hope. You know what? It, it occurs to me Maybe that's what you have this morning as, as you sit here today. I know it's hard to believe. You know, we all look so nice and, and, and our, we've got our church smiles on this morning. And maybe behind all that normalcy and fineness, maybe you're hurting today. Maybe you've been lost and drifting. And maybe... You just have a crazy hunch that God could do something for you here in this place. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. As hard as the pain is, it's so hard to admit your need. Maybe that's kept you from coming to God. Maybe you've taken a step 
or two towards Jesus. Maybe you were almost ready to come to Him, but then you saw others around Him. So clean and neat and trim and fit in their faith. And it kind of blocked your view. And so you just you stepped back. Listen to me. If that in any way describes you, I want you to carefully note this morning that only one person was commended for their faith that day. And it wasn't the crowds, and it wasn't the Pharisees, and it certainly was not the disciples, and it wasn't the, you know, the wealthy giver or the acclaimed teacher or even the most loyal follower. Only a shameful, hopeless, penniless outcast was commended for her faith. And all she had was a hunch that he could and a hope that he would. You know, that's, that's not a bad definition of faith, is it? A conviction that he can and a hope that he will. The woman displayed belief in Jesus and she was commended for it. The disciples, on the other hand, displayed unbelief. There was unbelief displayed by the disciples. You know, sometimes the disciples make me so mad, okay? By the way, I don't know why, because I'm just like them. I don't know about you, but I know I am. The disciples are what my grandma would have called a smart mouth. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? I mean, listen to what they say. This is Jesus. This is the living Word of God, all right? This is the Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah. Listen to what they say to Him. How are we supposed to know who touched you, Jesus? What? 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 Well, look at this crowd. How, how can we possibly know? It, it almost reminds you a little bit of when the Roman soldiers were mocking Jesus. Do you remember that? They were beating Him, and they were saying, You're the Messiah. You prophesy. Tell us who's hitting you. Right? And you get the feeling that in the midst of that crowd, they weren't exactly thinking about healing or redemption or restoration or transformation. That didn't seem to be on their mind that day. Maybe they thought those were things that should have been reserved for those closest to Jesus. For those who had a personal, in-depth knowledge of the Messiah and His teachings and His kingdom to come like they did, right? But you know what? It just wasn't that complicated. Faith is the belief that God is real and God is good. Amen? That's what it is. It's not mystical. It doesn't require visions or voices. Faith is simply a choice to believe that the one who made it all hasn't left it all. And that he still sends light into the darkness. And he still responds to genuine gestures of faith. That's what I believe. Now understand. Understand something. There was no guarantee that she'd be healed. Are, are you with me on this? She thought, if I touch his robe, I'll be healed. But she did not know for sure. There was no guarantee. And, and when we come to God with a prayer for healing, understand something. There is no guarantee that we're going to get... It, 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 there, I don't find the, the name it and claim it healing in God's Word. It's up to God to determine our healing. Yes? And sometimes He heals us in ways other than physical ways, yes? And sometimes He heals us, but not at the moment we think He should. So there was no guarantee for her when she came to Him. She hoped He would respond to her. She longed for Him to heal her, but she did not know if He would do that. Kind of makes me think of, of my children. I, I have a daughter and a son. Are they here this morning? No? They're gone? Good. I can talk freely about them. I have a daughter and a son who are 15 and 12 respectful, respectively. And of course, that's plenty old enough for both of them to think I'm stupid. Okay? That's just the default setting is I'm stupid. But, but, when they were little, when I liked them, okay, <laughs> I was their whole world. Do you, any parent, do you remember that? Do you remember when you were the universe in which your children existed? Okay? When they were little, they couldn't come close to comprehending my love for them. I mean, there's no way. They didn't understand the complexity of the world, uh, the complexity of life and mortgages and taxes and careers and families. All they knew when they were little is that I was there and that I was good. Right? 
Daddy, good. <laughs> all right? That's the way they saw me. And you could read it all over their face every time they'd see me again for the first time. All this woman knew was that Jesus was there and that He was good. That's faith. And let me tell you something else about faith. Faith is not the belief that God will do what you want. It's the knowledge that He'll do what's right. You know, that's where the disciples always fell short, isn't it? They thought He would do what they wanted Him to do. But let me tell you something. It's where we fall short as well, isn't it? You know why? Here's why. Listen to me. Because in the daylight, a little light doesn't mean much to us. But in the darkness, it means everything. That pin light that the, that the tour guide had before we went in the cave, I couldn't have cared less. I mean, she, if she had shown it out in the sunlight, I might not even have been able to see it. Didn't matter. Didn't register on my radar screen of importance. But the moment the lights went out, that light was huge. It was like a spotlight. And I believe that's what, was, what it was like for this woman. A healthy woman wouldn't and couldn't appreciate it. But it meant all the difference in the world for a woman who'd been living in pitch darkness. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody have a burden this morning? Emotionally, physically, spiritually? Do you realize that God's help is near and it's always available, but only to those who seek it? And yes, compared to God's part, you know, our part is just tiny, but it's necessary. We don't have to do much, but we have to do something. So let me ask you, if you carried a burden in here today, and you are not alone, trust me, you're not alone. But what is it that you need to do to start the process of healing in your life? What would it take? Write a letter? Confess a sin? Ask for forgiveness? Call a counselor, call a friend, call an enemy, visit a doctor, be baptized, feed a hungry person, pray, teach, go. Let me challenge you. Like this woman, do something to demonstrate your faith. And let me tell you something. God will respond. He never rejected a genuine gesture of faith. To this very day, God still honors radical, risk-taking faith. So whatever you do, never forget, when arcs are built, lives are still saved. When stones are flung, giants still fall. The blind are still made to see. Lame are still made to walk. The hungry are still fed. God will respond, not with faith like the disciples, but with faith like this woman. We've seen the facts. We've seen the faith. Finally, let's take a look at the fruit. The fruit. Verse 29 says, Immediately she was healed. That's physical healing. Write that word in. These three words are important. Physical healing. Immediately she was healed. She could tell inside her body something had changed after all those years. She knew it was not the same. She was freed from the thing that she had been feeling. She experienced physical healing. Verse 34. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Now, what kind of healing is that? Let me suggest this to you. It's emotional healing. Write that word in and let me explain why. You say, what, what, do what? Emotional healing. What does that have to do with anything? Daughter, your faith has healed you. That's the same as physical. She got healed physically, right? Physical healing. How long do you think it had been since anybody had called her daughter? Right? She hadn't been touched in 12 years. She hadn't been able to worship God in 12 years. She hadn't been normal in 12 years. She hadn't been on the inside in 12 years and suddenly this man, this prophet, this pr possible Messiah who can heal people when you touch the, the cloak that they're wearing turns to her and looks at her and says, You matter. Right? You're valuable. 
He called her daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. It was emotional healing. And then finally, verse 34, he says, your faith has saved you. That's spiritual healing. Your faith, this belief that I can do this, this belief that I am here and I am good and I'm going to do what's best for you and what's right for you and I'm going to take care of you in every possible way, it was spiritual healing. She realized her weakness. She submitted herself to Christ and she admitted to the crowd her transformation. You know what? Maybe, maybe, you're here this morning and you have a physical burden today. And there's hopelessness and there's brokenness involved with it. Let me challenge you. Listen. Submit yourself physically to God. Maybe you feel like a second class citizen. Maybe there are some things in your past that convince you that you're not worthy. Let me challenge you. Submit yourself to your Heavenly Father emotionally today. To a Heavenly Father who loves you more than you could ever know. Maybe, maybe you've taken a step or two in terms of faith in, in the past few days or months or even years. But now you realize that you're still missing something. There's a hole there and it's not filled. It's not right. Let me challenge you. Submit yourself spiritually. By faith, trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. And remember this, remember this, as you go away today, God still honors radical, risk-taking faith. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ. I don't know what pains you have. But I know what this woman's needs were. She, at an hour of great need, asked for and received His touch. And I don't know if the same has ever happened for you physically, emotionally, or spiritually. But listen to me. I know it can by faith. Bow your head with me. Let's go to our Heavenly Father right now. Maybe you're here today and you carry no burdens. Maybe you don't know what it's like to have trials and struggles and emotional and physical and spiritual and to feel like you're on the outside, to feel like there's a separation between you and God, to feel like you don't understand why God does the things He does or doesn't do what you ask Him to. Maybe you're here today and you have no burden. But I suspect that there are many more who come today with a heavy burden and who could say to their Heavenly Father, God, I need you to take this. If you don't take it away from me, I need you to at least help me carry it because I trust in you. I believe in you. I don't understand it all, but I know that you are here and I know that you are good. What's your burden today? Is it physical? Submit yourself physically to Him. Is it emotional? Submit yourself emotionally to Him. Is it spiritual? Submit yourself spiritually to Him. And trust that the God who made it all is still in control of it all. And He will respond to your faith. Heavenly Father, I just lift up every single person in this place. I don't, I don't know if I even believe that there are people here who don't have burdens. But maybe there are. God, thank you for that. I praise you and I say thank you for somebody who can walk into church with a totally clean conscience and a totally clean heart and just worship you in spirit and truth and never have to worry about hard times and hard things. But God, for the rest of us, I pray right now that in, in right now and in the moments and in the hours and the days and the weeks ahead that you would remind us of this radical risk-taking faith displayed for us in Mark chapter 5. And this woman, who you called daughter, who submitted herself to you and trusted you to heal her. And we ask for the same in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. We're going to worship together. 
let me encourage you. Go ahead and stand. Let me encourage you. Let's don't walk out the way we walked in. Isn't that what the Christian life is all about? Every single day, taking at least one step closer and closer to your Heavenly Father. Letting Him change you and make changes in you. I'm going to be praying for you this morning as we sing and worship. I'll be here if you'd like to come. If there's a decision that needs to be shared, if there's a prayer that needs to be prayed, I'm here. And I would love to do that with you. As we sing, as we consider God's grace in our life, let's worship Him with our hearts and our obedience. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine my soul raising my sin story this is my soul raising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my soul raising my Savior Submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in his love. This is my story. This is my soul. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my soul. Praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story. This is my soul. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Blessed assurance, 
Jesus is mine. Lift your voice. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. If you would bow your heads just very quickly, I want to challenge you to go to your Heavenly Father right now. Whatever it is that needs to be said to Him in these closing moments, Whatever needs to be asked of Him. God, how do I walk out of here differently than I walked in? God, what would it take this week for me to live out radical faith in my life for You? God, will You show me and remind me that You will help carry my burdens if I'll come to You and trust You. Father, thank you for your love and your presence in this place today. You are a good God and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.